Jess Clamor YouTube channel. Hey everybody, welcome back to 100 Things They Don't Want You To You To Know Conspiracy, Mystery and Unsolved Crimes. Now, in today's video, we're going to be looking at Bill the Dream Grey, whatever it was. Gene Spangler, there we go. Gene, big up Gene Spangler. Now my throat's still hurting, so apologies. I'm recording this straight after the last episode. And my hands aren't actually that red, it's just the colour correction on the video. So, Gene, Gene, Gene Spangler, what happened? So, what became of an aspiring Hollywood starlet? Starlet. When it happened, 7th of October 1949. As you can read up there. Sorry if this lighting's getting a bit much. Let's go. Yeah, that's not as contrasting. Uh, so, Spangler was the classic movie wannabe in her mid-twenties, blue-eyed and sultry. A few bit part film appearances had brought her closer to the stars, but stardom in her own right remained elusive. Divorced and with a young child, she left home one evening in autumn 1949, apparently to rendezvous with her ex-husband. She was never seen again. Though her purse was found shortly afterwards containing a cryptic message. This one seems amazing. And it is double paged. So this is Jean. Hello Jean, with your cross earrings and your nakedness. Uh, Jean Elizabeth Spangler was born in Seattle, Washington on the 2nd of December. Wow! A day after my birthday. Obviously not in 1923, but you know. On the 2nd of September. 
Professor Tsung their teeth into the story, with the mysterious message appearing on newsstands up and down the land. It certainly caught the attention of one rather well-known individual, actor Kirk Douglas, oh, who was shortly to be Oscar nominated for his role in 1949's Champion. Douglas realised that Gene had been an extra in one of his recent movies, the implausibly titled Young Man with a Horn. He promptly contacted the police to assure them that he knew her only in passing and, and certainly was not the Kirk referred to in the letter. Of course, he had propelled himself onto the police radar, but they were, as he had hoped, quick to clear him. Fair dues. Attempts to trace the actual Kirk or the mysterious Dr. Scott proved unsuccessful. Spangler had previously dated a Scotty, who worked in the Army Air Corps, and who had beaten and threatened her when she ended their relationship four years earlier, but the link was tenuous at best. There was also a shady figure known as Doc that the police heard about in some of the Sunset Strip bars where Jean used to socialise. It was alleged that he carried out illegal abortions for a price, and there were rumours that Jean was indeed in the early stages of pregnancy when she disappeared. There was even talk that she had got in a little too deep with a couple of henchmen of a notorious gangster, Mickey Cohen. Right, this is going a bit. Both the henchmen vanished, presumed murdered within a few days of Jean's disappearance, leading to some to suppose that there was a connection, although it has never been proven. Subsequently, there were even reported sights of Jean in the company of one of those hoodlums, Little Davy Ogle, in locations as disparate, is that classed as disparate or disparate, as California, Arizona and New Mexico, however none was ever confirmed. So the file on Jean Spangler remains open, with its cast of Hollywood hopefuls, fully fledged A-list stars, mobsters, angry exes and backstreet abortionists. Her case has long held the public imagination. Alas, those able to furnish answers as to her fate are, presume, uh, are probably long dead themselves. So, what do I think? She obviously mixes up in a dodgy crowd. You know, she's had two exes that used to beat her. She knew of and spoke about a guy called Doc, who presumably kept illegal abortions and whatnot. I mean, she's a very pretty actress, so I can see why people would want to, you know, intermingle with her but I've got a suspicion that she maybe had a new fella a new lad who she'd been dating I think that she lied as to her whereabouts in the first place I do think she was meeting someone as the clerk suggested the fact that she said she'd be going to an overnight set even though she wasn't needed on a set when the police asked sort of shows that she probably went to meet someone and probably went to have sex with someone that mixed along with, or maybe even met up with a guy called Doc to have an abortion. I don't know. Anything could happen, as Eddie Golden says. But in my own opinion, I think she went to meet someone. Something went horribly wrong. She ended up dying, or she went missing, or she was killed, or whatever. So I don't think she told the truth at all about her whereabouts or where she was going. That's my opinion. But then again, I'm, I'm not blaming her for her own death. That's that's preposterous. I mean, inevitably she died and went missing. And she hasn't been seen since. And I highly doubt she's still living her full life at 96 years old. In, in the deep dark depths of wherever. So, let me check out another drink. Almost all gone. I'm going to sit and order myself some dinner. So moving on, we have Ambrose Beers. What happened to the renowned American author and journalist when it happened 1940? We've seen a lot of American. I'm going to call this the American episode because an aspiring American artist and an American journalist and author, fair enough. Ambrose Bierce was a military man, adventurer and writer. Oh, we love them types. In late 1913, when he was in his early 70s, he took himself off to civil war-torn Mexico. Gee, I mean, to be fair, in his early 70s, that's, that's a good way. That's a good way to go, in it? The last letter he ever sent is said to have concluded with the line, As to me, 
leave here tomorrow for an unknown destination. He was never seen again, and his curious disappearance provides American literature with one of its most enduring mysteries. We love to see this. I mean, we don't like to see it, but we love to see it. Ambrose Pierce was born in Ohio in 1842, when the Civil War arrived. He enlisted in the Union Army and saw frontline action. He was even mentioned in the newspapers for his role in rescuing a fellow soldier in the 1861 Battle of Rich Mountain while under fire. In his late career as an author, meanwhile, he specialised in biting satirical... I'm not sure whether that's meant to say biting or writing. Satirical journalism, as well as short stories. His fiction was dark and often tinged with horror. Perhaps his most famous works were The Astringent, The Devil's Dictionary and The Civil War. Set an occurrence at Al... Civil War. Set an occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge. His personal life, meanwhile, was repeatedly touched by tragedy. Two of his three children failed to outlive him. His first son committed suicide in the late teens, and his second son died of pneumonia. His wife, meanwhile, died in 1905, just a few months after the couple had divorced. In 1913, the increasingly embittered and heavy drinking beers began a tour of some of the areas he had seen during the Civil War, taken in Louisiana and Texas. He next went over the border into Mexico, which was then in his third year of wait, which was then in its third year of a brutal civil war. Tracing his movements beyond this becomes quite a challenge. On Boxing Day 1913, he is reputed to have written. He is reputed to have written a letter to one of his dearest friends, Blanche Partington. What a name! Imagine me called a Blanche Partington. <laughs> This missive that supposedly contained the line about the unknown destination. Unfortunately, while there is significant circumstantial evidence that he did indeed write this letter, it has sadly not survived. It has sadly not survived, leading some to speculate over the authenticity of that particular part of the tale. But whether Beers wrote the letter or not, he was never heard of again, so what might have happened to him in Mexico? One story has it that Beers jumped up as an observer with the army of prominent revolutionary general Pancho Villa, or Villa. He is said to have travelled with Villa's troops to Ch Chihuahua. Hey, is it dog? From where he sent the disputed letter to Blanche Partington. Some say, I reckon they make these names up, surely. Some say he was then caught up in the rising tide of civil war violence dying after putting himself in the way of danger once too often, possibly during a siege in the early 1914, in early 1914. According to at least one source, federal troops killed him sometime in 1914 when they learned of his association with Veer. Others say that Veer himself had Beers executed after his sometimes confidant became rather too outspoken in his criticisms. Crit criticisms. This was a line taken by one Adolf careful. Adolf Dan Dan Danziger de Castro, author of an obscure 1928 biography of Beers, in which he claimed to have later met Via and discussed the matter. Via, according to de Castro, told him that Beers would indulge in drunken tequila fueled rants with Via treating his vapours with contempt. I knew him, Via said ominously. He has passed. Unfortunately, little is known of de Castro and establishing the veracity of his account, it's all but impossible. A few dissenting voices doubt that Beers ever made it across the Rio Grande, suggesting that the trip to Mexico was an elaborate hoax. Instead, the speculation goes. He checked himself into an asylum in California and saw out his days living close to his beloved secretary. What? Have I missed, like, her thing here? Okay. There are other even more outlandish theories, including that he was a spy investigating international plots against the Panama Canal, or that he had joined up with the famous British adventurer F.A. Mitchell Hedges, see page XX. What? What? Page XX. What's that meant to mean? 
haciendo un buen job This, this book, man Who are we looking for? A fate, Mitchell Hedges Mitchell Hedges, eight, page 85 and 196 I should catch you later, good.